So today we're going to look at unanswered prayer. Probably uh, many of you could tell us about a prayer that you have prayed fervently and sincerely, and yet you did not get the answer that you desired. If we looked at our uh, top five prayers from 2022 and looked at all of those, probably a lot of those top five, unfortunately for us, were not answered. And there's a reason why many, many prayers are unanswered, and I want to deal with that today, and we're going to get to prayers that are slam dunk, that you can depend on an answer from God. But first of all, let's look at some of those prayers that are unanswered. It seems like some of our prayers we pray and what we want is not on the menu. And no matter how we beg and plead and uh, bargain with God, it doesn't happen. Well, it could be that James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, when he wrote this letter, To Christians in the first century, he put his finger on something that even uh, applies for today. And that is from James chapter 4. The first part of this verse talks about getting things that we want and what we do to get things that we want. Uh, Apparently, uh, these people that James was writing to were pretty rough characters. They haven't been Christians that long. And so they would want something that somebody else had, and so they would just beat somebody up or argue, fight, or even kill to get what they wanted. I mean, this was serious stuff. James is writing to people who really don't know much about being Christians. And so he's saying, you've you've done everything you can to, to get what you want, but you wouldn't just think of asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. That's why it's not on the menu. You are spoiled children, each of you wanting your own way. Other translations say you're just asking for things, for God to give you things and make things happen so that you will have more pleasure. Aren't you glad that that was applicable in the first century, but no longer today (laughs) in our time, and certainly for no one in this building? Selfish, self-centered prayers for what we want, even no matter how sincere, I'll often go unanswered. We often begin our prayers with, help, get me out of this. Our desire is that Almighty God would rearrange the circumstances of our lives so that it would suit me better, so that it would not be bringing me difficulties, so that I would be able to have a more pleasant life. A lot of our prayers, if you think back through them, are desiring that God would change things so that we would have things better. Because after all, we're Christians. We're American Christians. And we're used to getting what we want in the marketplace. And by God, we want our prayers answered. We think that because we're Christians and going to heaven, that we're sort of on an inside track, that God should be answering our prayers. After all, what's God for? I've talked to people, and you may have to, who have uh, turned their back on God. In fact, they've used the words, I've ruled God out because he did not answer my prayer. I prayed for a promotion, and the other guy worked, got it. What use is a God like that? I prayed that my uncle wouldn't die, and he died. Who needs a God like that? I'll just live my best on my own, but probably down the road and Another circumstance that's extreme, another prayer goes up, help. But it doesn't work. What we need to do is go back to the scriptures, especially the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, we have stories about people that God loved and who loved God and who prayed prayers. And we're going to find that they had very different definition and requests for their prayers than we do. We'll be hard-pressed to find Christians in the New Testament praying for God to change their circumstances for their pleasure, or praying for things they don't have. We'd be hard-pressed to find promises in the New Testament that God will provide for us what we want when we want it. In fact, one person, uh, let's look at Paul, the Apostle Paul. Now, if you have an apostle in front of your name, you must be one of God's favorites, And Paul certainly was. He loved God, and God loved him. But uh, he didn't have such a smooth life, did he? 
I want to, I want to focus on one incident that happened in Acts 27. You can check it out later when you get home, but not now. So Paul found himself a prisoner. He was being taken from Judea to Rome to stand trial. And the transportation in those days was uh, worse than it was over our Christmas holidays. It's hard to find your way to Rome. They found a ship going that direction, and uh, the, the uh, soldier who was in charge of Paul and uh, others would catch a ride on these freight ships. And they got to a certain point, and they changed ships, one from Alexandria with grain going to Rome. Now, this is a huge ship, over 270 people on board. Paul and his guards and others who were hitching a ride, and then you had the crew. And so they were sailing, and it was nearing uh, fall. Uh, I've not really sailed in the Mediterranean. If you have, you may know that during the fall, the weather is sometimes not what you would prefer for sailing. And so as they sailed along, uh, they got a little buffeting of a storm, and they tried to take refuge on the south uh, side of an island until it looked like it was going to be okay. Paul said, you know, we shouldn't go now because this could get really serious. But the others decided they were going to go on. <laughs> hardly, hardly as soon as they left the uh, shore, the wind began to blow. Hurricane level winds, turbulence. The boat was uh, tossed to and fro. They even tied ropes around this boat so it wouldn't fall apart. I don't, you've probably been in an airplane and the uh, pilot announced that we may be experiencing some turbulence. Is that the worst thing ever? I hate turbulence because I don't know what it's going to be like. You have just a little few bumps and you're like, oh no. We're going to be dropping out of the sky. Then back up. And we hate it. Paul on this ship was experiencing worse turbulence than we ever could in an airplane. It was tossed to and fro, back and forth. And as Paul was uh, experiencing this, he was certainly praying, asking God for his wisdom and his care and insight. Now, this storm went on for over a week. No sun, clouds, when the uh, storm-tossed sea, a week it went on. Everyone was terrified, and they were constantly worried. Can you imagine? Worry is projecting a worst-case scenario. So probably these people on board were thinking about, when the ship breaks up, I will drown, and sharks will eat me, you know, whatever kind of... That, that's where they were in their minds. But Paul stood up. He had acquired wisdom from God. And you're thinking, oh, this is great. It's going to turn out great. He stood up and said, I urge you to keep up your courage. That courage that you don't have, by the way. I believe we'll get through this, but we'll be shipwrecked on some island. So he had some wisdom, some insight from God. But still the storm raged for two weeks. Two weeks. Paul's prayer was answered, but the circumstances did not change for the good. The peace was in Paul's heart, not around him. And so after two weeks, Paul again stood up and said, Now, <clears throat> you've been in constant suspense. You've gone without food. I encourage you to have a sandwich because you're going to need the strength when this ship breaks apart and you have to swim to an island. I don't know if that was perceived as good news or bad news, but Paul said, Take some food. He took some bread and broke it. And sure enough, uh, the ship began getting closer to an island. The soundings were, uh, the, the bottom of the ocean was closer and closer until finally they ran aground. And as they did, put the, the front of the boat into a sandbar, the back began to break up. Now, <clears throat> the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners so they wouldn't escape. But the one in charge of Paul said no. And so 270-some people swam to the shore. Oh, it's over, right? Oh, this is so wonderful. Yes, Paul, thank you. And then they started to build a fire to keep warm because they'd been in the ocean all this time, and a snake bit Paul. <laughs> Can it get any worse? And so we look at, the, we look at Paul. We look at this experience 
uh, of what happened. Somebody forgot to pray for traveling mercies for Paul, apparently. You know, we pray and ask for protection. We ask God will get us out of things. And yet, if we take seriously Paul's life and any other teachings in the New Testament, you will see that there are other things much more important to pray for than just for your circumstances to be what you would desire. Oftentimes, when people experience adverse circumstances and they pray, God, get me out of it, and the circumstances continue, they turn their back on God. You see, they turn their back on the only resource that would prove worthy of their time in these hard conditions. In the middle of difficulties, the last thing you need to do is become desperate and afraid and angry. How many of you have been there? And that makes things worse. In the midst of these difficult circumstances, turn to God and say, God, this is not pleasant. I pray that you provide me with what I need to get through this difficulty. You haven't got me out of it. You didn't prevent it. Then I know you're going to provide for me to get through. Let's look at several things about Paul. First of all, Paul wasn't mad at God. If you read this, you will see that he turned his trust toward God. You also see Paul could be described as someone operating with uh, wisdom, security, confidence, and compassion. He had compassion for those people who probably would want to kill him because he was a prisoner. Do you need that in your life somewhere? Yeah, we all do. Also, it's kind of funny. You'll see what I mean. Paul didn't rebuke Satan and tell the storm to stop. Unfortunately, there are many Christians who have empowered Satan beyond the limits God has given him to operate in our lives. We think Satan causes circumstantial difficulties. You go out and your car won't start. You begin to cast demons out of your battery because it's dead. But it doesn't help. All the time you're casting demons out of your battery. Guess what? One of the only things that Satan can do, he is doing to tear you down. He's accusing you. He's saying your life sucks. Nothing ever works out for you. You're going to be late. Nobody's going to like you. But we're over here concerned with casting demons out of the battery, and we're not paying attention to the onslaught and the schemes of your enemy who wants to take you down. It's important for you to understand Satan can't cause you circumstantial problems, but he can help you make them worse. God has limited Satan's ability in our lives. Jesus defeated Satan at the cross and rose again. Satan only has three weapons. They're very effective. The first weapon is accusation. That's part of his name. He will accuse you and say, you're no good. Your life sucks. He will accuse others to you. Look at those people. They're such losers. He will even accuse God to you. If God really loved you, he would be taking better care of you. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Accusation. If something starts with an accusation, you're such, you need to check where that's coming from. It's not from God. He wants to scare you. He wants to fill your mind with worried scenarios of bad things happening. So you get all scared and angry and reactive and make things worse. Accusation, fear, temptation to make bad things look good. You'll get away with it. You're special. Did you hear those three things? What are they? What's the first one? Accusation. Second one. Fear. Fear. Third one temptation. That's what he can, that's all he can do. And so it's very important that you be aware of his schemes because those thoughts just float into our head and pretty soon we're processing them. 30 seconds later, after imagining the worst case scenario, you're miserable and you make people around you miserable. Don't fall for it. And then we want to see that while Paul had wisdom and strength and compassion, Things didn't get better. I know some of you are here today. I've known many of you down through the years. 
you're faithful, you love God, you even tithe. But there's situations that happen and they don't get better. And we pray together and we pray for God's strength and courage and guidance in those situations. That's what he desires you to pray for. There's one other thing that uh, makes our uh, prayers uh, <clears throat> so that they don't work, and that is we ask for things. Now, we live in a society in a country. You have uh, clothes that you wear. You've got a car you drive. You've got a house where you live. But there's probably hardly a, a day that goes by that you don't see better clothes than you have on somebody else, TV, that you don't see a better car than you've got or a bigger, better house than you've got. And marketing is so savvy to create envy and discontent in your heart. And so we ask for things, and they don't come. And we give up, and we think God's not listening. We forget the teachings of the New Testament, especially Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at Matthew 6, 31, where he addresses this very thing. Jesus said, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? He says, your heavenly Father knows you need them before you even ask. The pagans run after all these things. So in other words, people who don't even believe in God are dead set to get what they want to fill their life with toys and material possessions and money and influence and power. But we're not like that. We're not pagans. We believe that God loves us. And he says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And I've known people who have put this into play. They have sought his kingdom and his righteousness and they didn't necessarily get all the things that they wanted, but they became content with what they had. What a gift that is. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. Doesn't that sound so religious? It's almost like you have to be in church for that to be operative, right? <laughs> Seek first his kingdom. What on earth does that mean? A kingdom is a location where there is a king. And the king rules over that area. And over the people. The people live by the king's rule. So when you seek first his kingdom, here's what you do. You seek God bring your kingdom rule into my life. Into my thoughts. May my thoughts be in line with your kingdom ways of joy and compassion. May my words my behavior, my decisions. You see, seeking his kingdom is not about religion. It's about you beginning to clean your thoughts out and allow him to rule in the way you think. Seek his kingdom. Obey him. Some people say, well, gosh, obeying God, I'd never have any fun. I want you to know that God's commands, his rules that he calls us to live by, or for life and joy and peace. And another thing you need to know is that for a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus, every command is not just a command. It's an empowerment. If he says, love your neighbor as yourself, he gives you the power and resources to do that. He doesn't just leave you there with a command. We think the commands are burdensome. You know, don't do this and don't do that. But yet when we realize that we line up with his commands, he empowers us to be able to obey because obeying his commands is beyond our strength and ability. Seek first his righteousness. Surely this is religious, right? Seek first his righteousness. What does that mean? God's righteous desire for your life what would your life look like if your life reflected his motivations, his love, his presence? 
often it, with couples, I will <clears throat> ask them to envision, what would your relationship as a married couple look like if God were able to bring about the very best you ever could hope for? That's righteousness. That's righteousness. You see, you were granted Jesus' righteousness when he died for your sins and forgave you. And you have the opportunity to bring that righteousness into your life and the life of others. Take just a moment and imagine a situation in your life that maybe now is not to your liking. Maybe some persons that are difficult for you. And quietly, under your breath, ask God to give you a picture of what it would look like if those reflected his righteousness. No, there wouldn't be people just singing hymns and praying all the time. A husband and wife would be loving each other and have a taste of heaven on earth, seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. You see, this is something that we do when you leave the building. You'll be able to seek his kingdom and righteousness as you pull into traffic, especially Seek his kingdom and righteousness. So we have his commands that are empowerments. We have his kingdom rule that we can come under and submit to. What are the slam dunk prayers? If you're pro Doug, thank you. Finally, we're getting to slam dunk prayers that God will answer. He's committed himself to. And these are the things. These are the prayers that you can pray with absolute confidence and faith. They're all through the New Testament. Uh, the writers, Paul and uh, Peter and John, James, uh, you'll find these prayers all through the New Testament, and you can pray them at home. You can pray them in your car as you drive. The first one is from Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Now, Paul is praying here for these people. Now, don't get confused. Colossae was simply a Grecian city. It's like the same as Carbondale is a city, or Glenwood is a city. So it's not to a bunch of religious people. These guys have only been Christians for less than a generation. And so he's praying for them that they will understand and feel full what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He says, we continually ask God, there we go, for this reason since the day we heard, we have not stopped praying for you. So in other words, this is a God-ordained prayer. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. You're standing at your house, and you're being accused or criticized. An argument could be brewing. But not for you, because you're going to pray, God, fill me with the knowledge of your will for this situation. Deep in my spirit, may I have the wisdom and understanding to know what to say next to this angry person. It sounds dangerous, but you can try it. And this is, can be personalized. I mean, Paul prayed this for them, and this is a prayer for us now. But how have you personalized this? Start with uh, uh, we and, and put I. I continually ask God to fill me with the knowledge of your will through all the wisdom and understanding that your spirit gives me. Can you do that? Can you turn that into a personal prayer? Let's just take a moment for you to do it. Practice it. Right here. Look at that. Start with I. Continually ask you, God, to fill me with the knowledge of your will through all the wisdom and understanding that your spirit gives me. And then he goes on. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Is there someone in your life that you would pray that they would live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way? Well, there are people in your life praying that for you. And we can ask, God, please, I want to live a life worthy of you. 
I want to please you in every way. I want to bear fruit in every good work. I want to grow in the experiential knowledge of you. As you leave this building today, as you walk out, did you know you can walk out with the wisdom and knowledge of God through his spirit? You could be a different person. You could be a person that brings peace and joy and love to a situation rather than that situation being aggravated by a reaction instead of a godly response. And so next, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you can have great endurance and patience. Anybody need a little extra patience and endurance, maybe? Stuff that's going on in your life? It's promised to you. Okay, this is going to bowl you over. You don't have to earn this stuff. Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and paid for it. It's paid for. It's for you to grasp and take a hold of and internalize. And these aren't religious things, are they? Because these are things that you need Tuesday, Thursday. These are things that you need in your life. All to be strengthened with his power. Do you ever feel weak and exhausted? You're stepping on my last nerve. <laughs> Do you ever feel that you're just done? Well, he wants to give you power according to his glorious might that brought about the universe. That's what he wants to do. And go on. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom. Do you realize this morning you're surrounded by holy people in the kingdom of light? Hey, look at someone and say, you must be one of those holy people. <laughs> Try it. It'll scare some people, but it'll be good. You must be one of those holy people in the kingdom of light. And go on, one more. I think. Is there another one, Jake? Maybe there's not. No, there is. Anyway, um, giving thanks, joyful thanks to the Father as he's qualified you. Now, I've, I've listed some uh, scripture passages at the bottom of your sermon study sheet. You can take home, look these up. There's one for every day. Look it up and read it and then personalize it and pray it and carry it with you throughout the day. These are slam dunk prayers. These are guaranteed answers. If you want to access what God has for you and what he wants to do for your life, this is it. He cares more about your character than your circumstances. And he will give you what you need to develop and strengthen your godly character regardless of your circumstances. So, in a moment as you take of communion, you remember that night before he died, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. So when you take communion this morning, thank God that he has provided for you all that you need for any situation you may find yourself in, that he'll be there for you. Turn to him in difficulty. Don't turn your back on him. Father, I pray as people have heard this today, that it will be encouraging. And many people will look at their lives, difficult circumstances, and begin to ask you, ask you for strength and wisdom and compassion to ride the storm, to ride the storm, and to bring blessings to others involved. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.